Today we're going to talk about how to set up a ball python tank. Now this is a 40 gallon tank. The make is Zoomed. Now, ball pythons can get quite large, but so before we start, let's talk about size. Ball pythons can get quite big. My adult female, who's upstairs, is actually pushing six feet. She's about five and a half going on to six. So for an adult, this can get quite cramped quite quickly. You might be able to get away with it with a really small male, but with this sort of setup, I'm thinking more baby ball python, and as it gets big and mature, and you see it getting big, then you go off and you do an upgrade. But for this setup, I'm thinking a ball python no longer than the length of this tank. The minimum for a snake is the length of snake. So this is 90 centimeters. So the maximum size snake that I put in here is 90 centimeters or three foot. So you can probably get away with really small adult males at a push, but mostly we're talking this size tank for a juvenile or hatchling bull python. For an adult, you really want to go on to upgrade much later on. So I just want to clarify, this isn't suitable for a big adult girl and probably most males that exceed three foot in the long run. But now that that's out the way, let's talk how to set this up. Bull pythons require a lot of humidity. In the wild, it doesn't really drop below 50% humidity. So you need to make sure that we maintain humidity in these tanks. Now the difficulty is that these tanks are screen top. I've got my screen tops down to the side here. So we need to figure out a way to make sure that we maintain humidity in an environment that is screen top. And the best way to do that is by giving them decent substrates. And by substrate, I mean the bedding that goes to the bottom of the tank. There are many types of beddings. Mostly some are dry shavings of wood and some are soils and cypress mulches and things that can hold water without molding and then release it as humidity. So you don't want any dry shavings for a bull python unless your environment in your room is sitting at like 80% humidity anyway. But for the most part, for most of us, we want to have a humid bedding, a humid substrate. So the substrate that I'm going to be using is a mixture of repti soil to play sand. There's a little bit of repti sand in there as well. Two parts repti soil to one part sand. You can also do this with things like top soil to play sand. It doesn't have to be a reptile branded product, just something that's natural and soil like that can hold water and then release it without molding. You can use things like the eco earths or the coconut blocks that have the big chunks in it. A lot of breeders use that too. But for me, I'm going natural soils and we're going for this mix. All I did was take two buckets, filled one of reptile soil, one of sand, and a third bucket was my mixing bucket and it was two soil, one sand, mix, mix, and just repeat that cycle until I filled up this bucket right here. So we want this substrate quite deep. So what's gonna happen is water is gonna go through to the bottom, it's gonna collect there in a humid microclimate near the bottom whilst the upper layer starts to dry out. So we've got our humid substrate, it's gonna be the foundation of this setup, but the thing is, this screen top is gonna to release a lot of our humidity. So how do we trap humidity in this substrate so that we get a slow release of humidity over time? And that comes down to leaf litter. So I've got a bucket. I've got a bucket of leaf litter here. Just general leaves, like oak leaves. You can collect them in your backyard. You can buy them online. You can buy them as products. Either or, if you want to like clean leaf litter by boiling it, you can do that too, whatever you want. I'm gonna start by covering the substrate. So what we're effectively doing is we're putting like a lid almost on our substrate. So water and stuff is gonna go through the substrate, through the leaf litter, into the substrate, to the bottom, and create that nice humid microclimate. But what's gonna happen as this dries out, this lid of leaf litter is gonna act as a buffer against losing humidity too fast. So it's going to dry out on top of the leaves faster, but then lock in humidity beneath. It's gonna slowly release that over time. And what that means is that over time, you're gonna to have to spray a little bit less. It's gonna help when you're away at work or at school and you can't be there to like micromanage humidity. It's gonna give us that nice slow release. You can have leaf litter as thick as you want, like even if it's like a couple of inches thick of thick leaves, that's gonna really help with this leaf litter. So next thing is we've established, we've got 
our substrate and our leaf litter, the foundations of our setup. Next, we need to think about decor. So decor for a ball python tank, what I'm thinking of is the ball python can access the entire length of this setup without being seen. So I want to cluster a lot of hides along this back wall. So if your ball python is feeling shy and it wants to not be seen and it's craving that security, it can be in any part of this setup without being seen. What you don't want is them to be needing something else like higher amounts of humidity or they want to bask and warm up or something like that. And because there's a chasm of space here, they don't want to travel across that and feel insecure. So what you're gonna have is them choosing between security and these other needs. And often a species like a bull python will choose security because if you don't choose security in the wild, you often will die. So to make sure that our bull python stays hydrated and is basking properly and is thermoregulating properly and it just feels secure so it lowers stress and we're having less issues crop up, let's make sure that this is nice and cluttered and nice and secure for them by cluttering this entire back way to make sure that they don't have to be seen if they don't want to be. So one of my favorite things to use is cork bark. Now you can find cork bark at places like Petco. Petco sells cork quite regularly. So the foundations of the setup as the bare minimums, the old school rule that we've always followed is a minimum of a hide on either end. So let's set up those foundations. So let's have a hide nestled in here and a hide nestled in down here. So now we've got our foundations in place and now what we want to do is build this up. So you want more than just a couple of hides, go crazy on that cork bark, just go for it. We want to nestle this in so it looks mature and a part of the earth and not just awkwardly sat on top. So push that in, make sure nothing's gonna fall and squish your ball python and get that in there nice and good. Takes a bit of fiddling around so you find something you really like, but you'll get the hang of it. Feel free to move it around until you get something that looks good, but also is functional and it's gonna serve your ball python and their best interests. So I'm gonna put in this big piece and see how this looks. Yeah, I like that. So with this big piece, it kind of looks like a burrow mouth. So what I want to do is almost build out this burrow along this back wall. So these cork tubes here can actually interconnect and make some form of like burrow network. So that's my thinking here. You might look at this and think, wow, that's excessive, but it really isn't. You think these animals are so cryptic and people have so many problems with them being scared or going off food when they're younger because they're just so exposed. Now this is a big glass tank. So when they look out, they're like exposed from all surroundings. So by cluttering this up a lot, we're just maximizing our potential success and keeping these guys happy and secure. What I'm gonna do is place our water bowl as well, just so we know that we have room for it as we're decorating. So we're gonna be using the Zoomed Reptile water dish, and I'm gonna place that right there. And now we know we have all this room to play with around the setup because we've got this place. So I am very, very serious when I say pack it in. Like you can start a juvenile ball python in any size tank, as long as it's escape proof and you could heat it and look after its parameters properly and you pack it out enough. Uh, some of the reasons why people start ball pythons in a tiny ass little tub is because they think that that's what they want for security. But in fact, you can actually provide that tiny cramped space in the form of how you decorate a large space. Because what you will find is that ball python, yes, will crave this, but it also will use this, often at night time when someone's probably not looking. Now, bull pythons do climb a lot in the wild. There's studies of them climbing up trees, seven meters up a tree, raiding parrot nests and eating birds and bush babies and bats. So the juveniles eat 70% birds in the wild. 70% of their diet is birds in the wild. So naturally they have an inclination to climb. And even if 
that there is no need for them to hunt upwards in captivity because we're feeding them. They still get the exercise from climbing because it's still a part of what they are. So we need to provide things to make sure that they can express those behaviours. So they can climb all of this, but also I want to provide some sort of branch in here that's going to make things just that bit more enriched. So I'm actually going to use the nook of that and place that like that. What you want to do is make sure everything is sturdy because there's no point in piling things up and it's not sturdy if your ball python is going to climb on it and it's just tumble down and fall in the tank. You don't want your ball python to hurt itself, so rock things and make sure like it's it's really secure. And that's how your like fail safe thing falls and things like that. I think I'm going to move this sideways just so it's a visual barrier rather than just being straight up for you to look into. This will add a lot more security for the ball python. I'm really liking the look of this. I think it's just starting to look really good. So you can add fake plants as well to add that bit of color in there that's appealing for you. Or you can use live plants. If you want to make this bioactive, we'll make a tutorial on that down the line. But for the sake of actually just doing potted plants, you can simply just add a plant in a pot and put it somewhere in this enclosure. For example, this here is a spider plant. This is perfectly safe, non-toxic. For a juvenile ball python, uh, it's not going to crush that too much. An adult is just going to decimate this, but there are a few plants that you can use that will be very successful in this setup. One of which is pothos. There's a few others, but let's pop this in our setup somewhere to just give it that little bit of colour. So if I have it at the back here, then have it so it's dangling forward into the setup, it looks very much like it's growing out of some craggy bit of wood or as part of the background, if you will. There's no background here, but you get what I mean. So this is looking really good now. I'm really happy with this. So the next part we need to talk about is the heating and lighting for our ball python. So let's get onto that. So what I'm gonna do is pop on the screen tops. We're gonna get onto our lighting for the setup. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is sort out our heating. Now, I'm not a heat mat guy. I like basking bulbs, I like them to bask in the sun like in the wild. So if you look at studies, um, they actually show that bull pythons will come out of their burrows and sit out at the mouth of their burrow in the sun to warm up. So many of the hunters that actually look for bull pythons to export to the pet trade actually look for signs of feces at the mouth of the burrow, tracks to show that a bull python has been there, or they find an actual bull python basking in the sun at the mouth of the burrow. So I think it's really important to allow them to do what they would actually do in the wild, which is bask in the sunshine. So like I said, this piece here opens up nicely and it looks like the mouth of a burrow. So this bull python can come up here, bask at the mouth of this burrow piece, and then descend right down to this background into this cork tunnel that goes all the way to this side in the moisture and the dark and be nice and safe. So they have that element of sunshine here, but darkness and humidity, and there's a gradient across all of this. So let's pop on our lighting. So I'm actually using this double dome just because that's what I've grabbed at hand to put my basking bulb in, but really you can buy a single dome just for your heat lamp. So let's pop that on. So now we've got this nice warm glow, just like sunshine that's gonna warm this patch with nice rich infrared that's gonna penetrate deep into that ball python's back, reach the blood vessels, get pumped around that body, and it's gonna do a really good job at heating up our ball python. So the next part of lighting that I want to talk about is UVB. Now, I think UVB is essential. The amount of basking behavior that I see in bull pythons when they have it, mine basks a lot, more so than I ever thought they would. So for me, I would really provide UVB to these reptiles. So what I've got here is Zoomed's Reptisun. It's a T5 long tube, the 10.0. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pop it at the front there. So we've got our UVB on at the front here. So we need to make sure that there is some space beneath it 
just so our ball python isn't getting too close to our UVB so it doesn't get overexposed. UVB is really, really good for ball pythons, but you can have too much of a good thing. So what I'm going to do is make sure that there's not something that can allow them to get right up to that UVB. It's just shift it across just so it's around here. So now it can kind of get close to it if it's on the edge of this branch here, but most of our UVB is hitting this bottom area here. So this right here is called a solar meter. It's point and shoot, and it's gonna read how much UVB is coming off our lamp. This was originally designed for like sunburns and human exposure to the sun. But in this instance, we can actually use these to measure our UVB lamps. So what we're getting here is a UVI of 1.5. And that's perfect for a ball python to have that low level of shade across this front area. So what we're seeing here is this the 10.0 Reptisun on this tank along the floor where that is, is around 1.5, the low shade levels of UVB that we actually want to give our bull python. So with this at floor level, perfect. Many people think that because it's a 10.0, it's for bearded dragons and stuff, but actually it's rather weak when it goes through a screen. Now what a screen does, obviously there's the grid, it's gonna hit the grid of the screen and bounce back. So only a certain amount of light and UVB goes through. And this mesh reduces it by about 30%. So actually, even though people think of this as a stronger bulb, when you actually get it through mesh and when this tank is actually perfect for when they're sat on the floor. Ideally, when you design your setup, you want your lamps to be clustered to one side as much as possible. So you have a little patch of sunshine and then a shaded end over here, just like in nature, a ball pythons will go out into the sunshine, bask, and then go off into the shade when they've had enough and they want to cool down. So with the basking lamp, as long as the basking surface under this lamp is around sort of like 30 degrees, to like 35, I think 35 is 95 Fahrenheit at a maximum around sort of there. Those are good sort of like basking temperatures. Good lamps to use will be the Zoomid Basking Spot or the Exoterra Incandescent. They are really good. Again, they're linked in the description. Both of those are really good basking lamps. Now you might find that if it gets too hot on the thing you've designed as the basking platform, then you want to go down to a lower wattage bulb. So if you're using 100 watts and it's getting way too hot, go down to 75, test. If it's getting too hot, go 50. And you've got to find that Goldilocks zone where your ball python can bask appropriately. Air temperatures in the wild can go up to sort of like 27, around that sort of area. It doesn't really drop below 20 at any point in time, day or night. So what I would do is have all of this on during the daytime, have 12 hours, and then 12 hours night time. So have it all on during the day, have a mechanical timer or something on the wall, plug it into that, set that up so it's got 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and then it'll turn all your basking sunshine side off at night. Then you just allow it to drop down to sort of like 20 degrees. If it starts dropping below 20, then what you can do is add a ceramic heat emitter or something, or a heat pad to one side if you really need to, just to bolster those temperatures. What I will say is make sure you use a thermostat on all your heating appliances just for safety's sake. When you want to measure your air temperatures in your enclosure, whether you use a probe and a digital thermometer or an analog one, just make sure you're measuring from the shade side because if you place it under the sunshine patch, all you're measuring is how much the lights can warm up the thermometer and give you an elevated reading above what the actual air temperature is. So make sure when you're trying to measure the air temperature, measure from the shaded side. There is no air temperature in the basking side, ambient midway, ambient shade. It's not like that. Actually, there is only one air temperature. It's in sunshine, out of sunshine. If you're on a field and you get really hot because you're stood in the sun, and you go and stand under a tree, it's not because the air temperature has changed from there to there, it's gone from in sunshine, out of sunshine. So this ambient that you're measuring at the shaded end is actually the air temperature of the entire thing. The only time where air temperature actually changes is top to bottom because heat rises. So it's a misnomer when people think they're doing cool side, ambient midway, ambient hot side. All they're measuring is how much they can move and heat up the thermometer. So this on the cool side, 
It's all you need to measure and then measure your sunshine, the surface temperatures, your UVI, and make sure it's within safe bounds. The last thing you want to do is to make sure that you maintain humidity in the setup, is to spray it down, pour water in the substrate if you need to. If you look on the glass, you will see that there's moisture on the underside at the bottom of this substrate, and it sort of gets drier as it goes up. Keep it like that and your humidity will be fine. Use a hydrometer and measure that. By adding water to the environment, eventually it gets evaporated and adds humidity to the air. So the way that you control humidity is by adding water to the environment, whether that's by spraying the entire thing down or pouring water into the substrate, you need to make sure that things are moist and has a humid microclimate in the soil, but it's not sodden and wet. If it's wet and it's sat in a puddle, then that can lead to things like scale rot and things like that. But as long as it's just moist and it's not a puddle, you're fine. So if you want to see me do more setup videos, I'm gonna do leopard gecko, king snake, all of the above. Subscribe to this channel and I'll see you in the next video.